Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. I'll start in a few minutes, just waiting for people to, to get on board. Hi, everyone. If you're joining, we're just going to wait one more minute to start. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, welcome to Midwest Dairies value added milk understanding growth and opportunities webinar thank you for joining i really appreciate it um, my name is maureen windish and i am midwest dairy senior manager of consumer insights and analytics although i'm relatively new to midwest dairy i have been researching consumers in the food industry for over 20 years before joining midwest dairy last march i used to work at iri um, for a time, also and the NPD group, and then several food companies. Most recently, I worked at Michael Foods, which is a large egg processor in Minnesota, and there I learned eggs are not dairy. <laughs> I am very excited to be at Midwest Dairy and Earthing Opportunities in the dairy industry and sharing our insights with you. Um, as you know, Ms. Midwest Dairy engages in a variety of research with premier market research firms. Um, I will lead you through this webinar, which incorporates timely insights from several of our key research partners, such as IRI and Mintel, as well as some recent proprietary research that we have commissioned. Um, so it's custom research from Midwest Dairy. Um, I invite you to ask questions through the Q&A feature, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, we will send you a link to the presentation as well as this recording. So let's go ahead and get started. So for our agenda today, um, I always think it's very helpful when you're exploring trends to take a step back and think about the consumer mindset and what they're thinking in terms of milk, as well as purchase drivers around milk. Um, so we'll start there and then we'll get into value added milk retail trends Specifically, we'll be focusing on lactose-free for a bit of time, as well as the ultra-filtered milk option. Um, both of these segments within the value-added milk segment have been growing, and so we'll um, kind of focus some of our attention there. So thinking about the consumer uh, mindset, um, it's helpful to think of the consumer mindset in terms of consumer confidence index. Um, this is tracked year over year, actually month over month, um, by the conference board. And you can see, you know, there's there's definitely times throughout the last, you know, 20 years um, where confidence has really plummeted. And today um, we're, you know, seeing a dip in confidence. And really what that means is that consumers' um, confidence in the economy and their willingness to spend maybe you know trending downward they're um, thinking a lot about their pocketbook and how to cut back and ways that they can conserve their their money um so you know it is a concern that it is below 100 100 is kind of average um numbers above 100 indicate that consumers are willing to spend and are feeling pretty comfortable with not only their present situation but also the future situation um and so numbers that trend below 100, which is where we're trending, you know, more recently, you know, it is something to watch out for. Um, we're not falling off a cliff here with consumer confidence, although sometimes, you know, we think that with inflation being so high, but um, 
you know, in reality, consumers are feeling the pinch and they're starting to tighten their wallets. So working in the food industry for a long time now, I have never looked at consumer trends where these were not top priorities for consumers. Consumers are always trying to juggle health and wellness with affordability, enjoyment, sustainability, and convenience, as well as some other attributes. But these are really, you know, the top of mind attributes when consumers are thinking about food. And how I know that is because we have data. Um, and this is um, data that comes from Mintel. They do a consumer survey each year, ranking the importance of different food features. And the question really that was posed to consumers is which of the following characteristics are important to you when you're buying food? So this is just food in general. And not surprising, we almost always see taste um, out coming out on top with 72% of consumers saying that taste is the most important feasibility, that's 55%. Overall nutritional value, 45% are saying that. Natural ingredients, 41, and that ties with convenience for um, convenience of preparation. So these are all things that you know consumers are thinking about when they go to the shelf, when they go into a restaurant, and they're they're making their food choices. Um, thinking about that in the context of milk, Mintel recently published a report that looked at um, dairy milk. And uh, compared to alternative beverages, and the most the top selling alternative beverage is almond milk. So when you um, compare almond beverage next to dairy milk and perceptions, you can see that when it comes to good tasting, dairy milk comes out on top. Um, forty eight percent of consumers agree that this attribute aligns well with their perceptions of milk, dairy milk. Um, on the nutritious side, that's another strong point for dairy when it compared to almond beverage. So 38% of consumers saying that, you know, dairy milk aligns with being nutritious and then good texture, 28%. And again, you know, comparing that to the almond milk, it's far below, um, where dairy milk, um, is perceived. So certainly dairy milk has, you know, overall positive um, reaction from consumers when it comes to taste, nutrition, and performance. And those are the strong points, especially when you compare it to an almond beverage. Moving on, um, a, additional information from Mintel um, did ask in this most recent report, how consumers would describe their most ideal dairy milk. Um, so specifically thinking about dairy milk, what are the attributes that consumers would align with a, an ideal milk? So they're saying, you know, 38% are saying some type of reduced fat. So that's not everyone. It's 30, 38% of consumers. Grade A would be 37% of consumers. High protein, fortified, comes in at 28%. And then some other attributes down below, you know, that I just really want to call out specifically that seems to be growing in the mind of consumers are functional benefits. So those that relate to, you know, brain health and eye health and bone health would be included in there. Um, so, you know, consumers are really, you know, they're evolving in what they're expecting from milk. I don't think, you know, several years back, we would be thinking about the functional benefits of milk and what that can deliver to consumers but it is rising in the mind of consumers and definitely an opportunity for future development. I don't think we'd be, you know, we're not terribly surprised by high protein and fortified with additional vitamins as being aligned with an ideal milk since those kind of naturally fit already what's going on in the category. I do think it's a little interesting that last um, uh, item at the bottom, ultra filtered, 9% of consumers saying that that aligns with their ideal milk. I do think there's a lot of consumers that don't know what ultra filtered milk is. Um, I think the, uh, the you know, category um, has been trying to educate consumers on what this is, especially with the launch of Fair Life, you know, not that long ago. Um, but, you know, it is a, is a, it's an attribute that I think consumers just don't quite understand yet what the benefits of an ultra filtered milk are but they think about it more in terms of high protein 
and other, other, other benefits like the lower lactose that come from ultra filtered milk. And at Midwest Dairy this past spring, we did a survey with consumers in the Midwest Dairy region specifically, and we asked them, you know, what would motivate them to purchase more milk in the future? And some of the things that popped out on top um, were, you know, a milk that's more nutritious, a milk with more protein, and a milk with longer expiration dates. Um, not to say that other things aren't important, but these were the things that popped out as being 25% or more consumers, saying that these would help them purchase more. I do think it's interesting at the bottom there, we, we see 24% um, say that nothing would mo motivate them to consume more, more milk. And you know that's just a fact of life. So there are some consumers that we're not gonna be able to move the needle with, no matter what we do with the category. Um, so this type of information, you know, just drilling down into our region um, helps us understand where we, you know, where trends are going specifically within the Midwest dairy region. Some other information that we got from our most recent study was about um, lactose or dairy sensitivities in general, allergies included in that. Um, for our region specifically, you can see on the left that for the most part, there aren't you know, high levels of dairy sensitivity. In other words, 70% of consumers say that there's no um, dairy sensitivity in their household. Um, of course, there are some that say that there are sensitivities either in the household or personally for them. I did think it was curious with this last round of research, we amped, amped up the Gen Z population. So we were able to dice out their particular viewpoints on this and they over index for sensitivities. So 50%, 57% of Gen Z say that they either personally or someone in their household has a dairy sensitivity. Um, it is interesting, you know, this is um, maybe not uh, a hard science when people think about sensitivity. They may be experimenting with dairy and, you know, have an opinion that it's affecting their, their gut health. Um, but if you look to the right, you can see that how does this affect people's behavior? 46% um, are saying that they're not limiting dairy, even if it, they do have a sensitivity in their household. Um, 40% of those say that it slightly limits their um, use of dairy. And then um, only a few, 14% say that it severely limits their dairy consumption. So, um, you know, sensitivity definitely plays a role, especially when we talk, when we get down to talking about the value added segment, since much of that is lactose free. Um, but I just wanted to point out, you know, kind of where things fall in terms of sensitivity and consumers reaction. Um, you know, a response to sensitivity, it doesn't completely mean that they are going to omit dairy from their, from their, um, from their lifestyle. We also have some great information from Anova Market Insights. They provide us with um, nice reports that help us understand food claims, both globally and, you know, in the U.S. This particular chart looks at the claims that we're seeing on milk specifically in North America, looks at top claims, and they're not ranked in order here, so I'm just going to call out that um, the top claim within the milk and plant-based um, alternatives, so they're combining both of these together, um, the top claim is gluten-free, followed by high source of protein. So nearly um, uh, half the products in North America have some type of gluten-free claim. And again, that includes not only dairy, but plant-based alternatives in that number. And then the other, the other high claim with 45%, so almost half, um, is high source, um, a high source of protein. So there's some other smaller things here worth noting is that fiber is starting to show up a little bit more as well as omega-3. So those would be opportunities to bring forward in the future potentially, um, assuming that consumers um, find value in that. So overall, just kind of thinking about um, the consumer mindset, 
and what the outlook is for the rest of 2022. I know we're already halfway through it, but you know, with with inflation continuing to um, press on consumers, we're definitely going to see consumers looking for value in products and making sure that everything they purchase fits their budget and probably making some tough choices to maybe not purchase certain things and 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 purchase more uh, or I should say um, you know more affordable products on the on the cheaper side of the scale um, consumers but they you know given that they still want to treat themselves they still want to feel good about you know um, what they're able to do with what they have um, they're going to up optimum you know they're on top of mind is optimal health so they will prioritize their health and their self-care. Immunity boosting benefits of products um, seem to be top of mind still. Um, I know obviously the pandemic had a lot to do with that. Functional benefits, especially with, with regards to mental and physical well-being. And that mental well-being is, is a rising concern for consumers and really was born out of the pandemic and a lot of the, um, you know, challenges that many of us face during that time. Um, Premiumization is also a trend that will continue. Um, you know, people want to elevate their experiences at home still. A lot of people are still feeling like, you know, a little wary of COVID and probably have, um, you know, retreated a little bit into their homes, especially as, as COVID spikes here and there throughout the country. Um, premium ingredients will continue to be important, artisan and then ethical. Um, again, all of those kind of tie into elevating products for consumers. And of course, on the right, you know, we can never forget about consumers, you know, demanding that companies act in responsible ways. Um, this will always be a part of the mindset. And I think especially, you know, with climate change and some of our unfortunate incidences, especially lately. This just continues to rise to the top and in, uh, in the minds of consumers. So now we can um, dive into the retail sales of milk. And as many of you guys know, I'm sure, um, you know, there has been a declining trend with the exception of COVID, where COVID, um, you know, forced lockdowns and a lot of people were obviously racing to the grocery store to get various things, including milk. So during that time, we saw a 2.2% jump, um, which was an abnormal rate of growth. Um, and so in response to that abnormal rate of growth in 2021, the number went more negative than we had seen in the past. More recently, when you look at milk trends um, on a year to date basis, which is in the upper right hand corner of the screen, um, you can see that it's more in alignment with what we were seeing pre-pandemic. So more recently, those trends have returned to about a 4% rate of decline, most recently 3.8%. So putting um, you know, our value-added milk um, analysis in context to what's going on in the, ca in the category in total, it's really important to you know, understand that you know, milk as a category is seeing some um, dramatic challenges despite the fact that COVID gave it a boost. Um, but so value-added milk, we'll talk about that next, obviously getting to the meat of our discussion here, but um, wanted to make sure that everybody understands what's included in value-added milk. It's not an intuitive definition. Um, this definition does come from DMI. And so a lot of the data that I have here is based and wrapped around an aggregate of products that they have identified. Um, Primarily, those products are this list that you see here. Um, so lactose free and reduced is included in this aggregate, as well as organic items. Another grouping called health enhanced items. And that's where you would find the ultra filtered products, as well as those that are fortified with extra nutrients, such as DHA. And then pre and pre and probiotics. Um, Enhance are also in this grouping. So the, those that are in that grouping must be cultured, but cannot be a yogurt drink. So those are our primary groupings for value-added milk. And some of these are not, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. 
Um, clearly, you're going to have organic products that are lactose free. So these are just, you know, the attributes that are that go into what is considered value added milk. So that value added milk represented roughly 13% of all milk volume sold this past year. So this is through the 52 weeks ending June data. Um, so it's it's a you know a sizable piece of the pie. Certainly, it's not the majority, but it is um, an important segment that consumers are gravitating towards. When you look um, on this slide, we're looking at the volume sales in millions, and then the percent change. So the growth is um, charted at the top of each bar. Um, so year over year growth within the value added segment, most recently 2.6% for this most recent 52 weeks ending June. Um, that growth is on top of three prior years of growth. Um, it is really impressive to see any segment <laughs> with this kind of growth rate, especially since COVID you know, did disrupt this trend and give it even more of a boost. Um, and we're still seeing growth on top of those um, COVID times. And so it is really impressive to see continued growth in this category. I wanted to layer in plant-based next to this. Um, I, I am really struck. One of the things that I was really struck by when I first started was the size of the value added segment relative to plant-based alternatives. And we can clearly see from this chart that plant-based is not as big as the value added segment. Um, it is about 40% less um, than what, what value added brings to the table in terms of volume. Um, and with plant-based, um, even though we saw growth in prior years, we are not seeing that continue into this year. So growth within the plant-based alternatives flattened. It is now 0% versus a year ago where it had you know, shown steady growth year over year. So it's, it's kind of bottomed out. Part of that is likely, it's not probably all consumer driven um, in terms of um, you know, they're backing away from plant-based plant alternatives as, as much as it's driven by economy. And so you know, with inflation and um, consumers having to make hard choices, they're probably gravitating to cheaper alternatives, and that cheaper alternative is, you know, regular milk. Just wanted to take a moment here just so you better understand what's going on with plant-based alternatives and, you know, where the growth is coming from, because not, um, you know, there are some pockets of growth within the plant-based alternative segment, and that that growth is really coming from oat beverages. So um, strong growth, you can see in the middle of the table there. Um, this past year, oat grew almost 50% versus a year ago. And in prior years, it was astronomical growth. Um, I imagine we'll probably continue to see growth in that category as more products come on the market. Um, but you can see where the declines are coming from. So almond, which is the number one plant-based alternative, is seeing a decline of 5.1%. Soy has been trending negative for quite some time um, and lost another 10% more recently. And then coconut beverage, which had been trending po positive, um, went negative this, this last year. Um, at a rate of over 10%. So that's a dramatic double digit growth or loss in volume over this past year. Moving on, um, of course, we want to dive into what's going on within the value added segment. And in this slide, you'll see that each one of the segments I mentioned earlier, lactose free, organic, health enhanced, and prebiotic probiotic are all laid out here in this table. Um, we have been seeing growth in organic, but that dropped off with the most recent data. 
um, at negative 4.5%, but all the other um, pieces, so to speak, of the value added category are growing. And lactose free is the um, highest selling um, attribute followed by organic. Um, but that health enhanced is really picking up. Um, it had, you know, healthy growth last year, 13% on top of um, another 10% this year, and then very healthy growth with the pre and the pre and um, probiotic. That's a lot smaller, of course, but um, I'm guessing with those growth rates, we'll continue to see growth in those segments as well. So healthy growth really throughout um, the entire segment of value added with a kind of a watch out on that organic um, option. Again, more than likely that's coming down because consumers are having to make hard choices because of inflation but um, a very healthy segment overall with a lot of promise. So let's just talk briefly about lactose-free milk. And in this chart, we're looking at the top retailers for milk in general. Um, you can see what each of these top retailers represent in terms of overall volume share on the left. Um, all of these retailers on this page represent 65% of the milk sales in the US. Um, you can see where their milk sales are trending in terms of volume. You can look at it um, full lactose versus lactose free, which is kind of the point here, is that on the lactose free side, we're seeing a lot of big growth numbers across these accounts, um, especially you know, double digits in at Walmart and BJ, BJ's, BJ's. <laughs> um, and all of those that are growing strongly, those four that are circled, are growing well beyond the, the market rate, kind of the total US number of 4.9%. So very healthy growth within lactose-free um, and you know, certainly an opportunity to continue product development in this area. This chart looks at the different brands that are participating in this segment. We can see the majority of the sales um, are really you know, two brands only, and then private label does get a sizable chunk at 18.4%. But a lot of those smaller um, brands you know, probably have an opportunity to play bigger, especially Chobani um, with their brand recognition um, and likely will continue to innovate in this space as well. Um, so Hood Lactaid, I know they've been doing an awful lot of advertising and I'm sure they offer quite a few promotions, um, have the lion's share of the segment at 44.6%, followed by Share uh, Fair Life um, at 28.4%. So two big brands, um, you know, gathering up a lot of market share here in terms of volume. And next we'll talk about ultra filtered milk. Ultra filtered milk, if you recall, is part of the value added um, segment and it falls within the health enhanced um, attribute. And we saw a lot of growth here. The majority of the, the growth is really coming from branded product. Um, again, these numbers you see are really strong growth rates, all double digit on top of double digit growth um, and represented all the way through 2000. Um, 21. So I don't have a most current read on this, um, but I could probably get one eventually for this presentation. I didn't have it, but um, we, you know, definitely see that this this segment should continue to grow just based on history here. And these are the brands: <laughs> Total Fair Life, um, obviously leading this segment. Uh, with 94.4% of all the volume. And then you can see on the left, there are a number of new players. Good Mood is one of them um, launching more recently. Some of them have been in the category for you know, more than a year, but it's still a very new segment um, with Fairlife leading the way. And they have several brands. So they have their flagship Fairlife product, um, as well as one called Yup. Super Kids and Smart Milkshakes, which currently has 0.0% .0 share on this chart, but I'm, I'm sure it has grown a little bit since 2021.
And these are the products um, just in terms of evolution that have um, come on the market. So um, as I mentioned, Good Mood is a relatively new product. And then Shivani launched a product in 2022. Um, so it will really be interesting to see, you know, how consumers continue to respond to this given inflation. Obviously, you know, crossing our fingers that we continue to see very positive growth rates, but we will, of course, be tracking that as time goes by and make sure that you are privy to um, where the growth is coming from. So kind of mirroring our, our summary here, um, you know, as I mentioned, the volume sales for value added milk um, are growing consistently year over year and are very much in alignment with what consumers are looking for in terms of really just food in general, um, higher protein, lower sugar, um, uh, you know, convenience, because I know that also um, single serve products have been helping to grow this category. So consumers are, are really, you know, engaged in value added. And when, especially when you compare it to conventional milk, which for this period was down 5.3% when we saw growth and the value added of 2.6. So definitely bucking the trend, a bright spot for the milk category. Um, and then when you compare that growth to the to plant-based alternatives, that gap keeps widening as the value added milk se segment continues to grow and plant-based flattened out this last year. Um, among value added milk attributes, that's lactose free um, and reduced now has the highest volume sales. And that continues to grow year over year at a very good clip. Um, ultra filtered brands grew for four consecutive years. And over that time, the average growth rate was 23% for all of those years combined. So the future looks very bright for value added milk as consumers continue to seek out nutrient dense products, especially those with higher protein, lower sugar, lactose being the sugar in milk, and then looking for added nutritional benefits. And in the future, it seems likely that consumers will continue to look for milk to help them with other um, health issues like immunity, mood, and brain health. So these would be opportunities that potentially the value-added milk category could latch onto and build out for consumers as they're looking for products and that, and that um, with those attributes as well. Um, so that's really all I have for you guys today. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. I noticed that we have one question in the Q&A. Um, it says milk doesn't have high source of fiber. Is the insight that in that area to explore for innovation or is it just trending? Um, so that, that slide that I talked about, I think where the fiber showed up um, was a combined aggregate of both dairy milk and milk alternatives. So I think milk alternatives are latching on to that high source of fiber. Um, I have seen that show up in the yogurt category as more, you know, as fruit is included and they're probably amping up the amount of fiber from the fruit in some of those flavors. So it, I think it definitely could be. Um, fiber is an attribute that consumers are looking for more of. Um, it does go hand in hand with being, you know, with just digestion. If you don't have fiber in your diet, you know, you don't get the most out of your food. So I, I do see that rising on the radar of consumers, especially, you know, in the wake of so much protein emphasis. Any other questions? All right, well, that concludes. If you do have additional questions, um, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I do have my contact information to share with you. Let's see here. So this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, also, Martha Kemper, she is the Vice President of 
um, dairy experience. And she is available for questions as well. And we are more than happy to help you um, especially capitalize on the value added dairy segment, as well as any other dairy opportunities you'd like help with. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.